Now, you said this morning that there's no people anywhere else but on earth. What verses that say that in the Bible? How many of you wondered that? Nobody? Okay. Well, it's, it's a, that is a very good question. Um, if someone asks you to prove from the Bible, now this is not a rhetorical question, this is a direct, flat out you know, question to you. If someone asks you to prove from the Bible how you know that there's not life on other planets like human life, how many of you would know where to turn in the Bible? Hold your hand up high. Okay, good. There's a brave soul. Good. I see. Okay, three of you so far. I'm going to call you up in just a minute. Um, think about that. We are in an, a naturalistic, evolutionary world. And it's simple for them to say, life evolved everywhere. I mean, you know, at different speeds, uh, different blobs. I mean, I just watched the National Geographic uh, film on the creation of the universe, which they called, you know, the Big Bang. It was fascinating. Someone spent a lot of money on that. And they actually went from nothing to an explosion, to the hot, to the spin, to the, the spin-off of spins, and all of a sudden it was raining. And, you know, I mean, it was just the most amazing movie I've ever seen. But where would you go in the uh, Bible? So I would like you to uh, think with me about what most people never think about. I mean, when people talk about, you know, Star Wars and, you know, all the civilizations and aliens and ETs and everything, they're not thinking biblically because, uh, and, and these are the verses that, uh, that immediately come to my mind. Uh, Genesis and just rehearsing the, the creation account, the restatement of the creation account um, in many places. Um, then, the very fascinating description that Second Peter gives us, and finally, looking at heaven and who is there. And those would be the streams of thought that I would have. So let's just look there. Let's, let's look for aliens real quickly in uh, Genesis 1. And, and what you have to test yourself about tonight is, do you just believe what it says? Or do you want to fall prey to saying, well, it says that, but it doesn't mean that. Because as soon as you take what God's word says and say, that is what it clearly says, but it couldn't mean that. Now, if there's a compelling reason, like in this question, um, you know, when it says... Um, you know, God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But then in the Lord's Prayer, it says, lead us not into temptation. You would never, you would never take a clear scripture, which is in James 1, that God cannot be tempted with evil, if I don't trip up here, and he doesn't tempt anyone. That is clear as day. I mean, it's just black and white. So whenever you have a clear teaching of the word of God, you always will interpret something you're not sure about. So that is a, a principle of interpretation. But when you have something clear, and it's repeated and repeated and repeated, you can't say it has to mean something else. So in, in Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And heavens, it defines heavens. It says that's where the sun and the moon and the stars are. So it's not talking about the sky on a single planet of many. It's talking about a specific place where there's one planet with one life that's described and then the heavens. And, and it goes through that. And by the way, in the elder prayer this morning, I thought something very interesting. You notice in Genesis 1, 1 through 5, one of the elders was praying and saying, Lord, thank you that on this day you separated the light from the darkness. And, and remember, in God's way of looking at things, the first day of the week is what day? Sunday. That's today. 
this is creation week. This is, this is the beginning of everything we know about life and the calendar and time and everything else. This is the first day. This is Sunday was the first day of creation. And that in the evening and morning were the first day. And then there's the second day of the week. And God rested on the seventh day of the week, which is Saturday, which is where the Sabbath comes from. So it's just fascinating. But that's the Genesis account. Now look how Paul restates it. So uh, what Genesis says is that God made the heavens, and he defines the heavens as where the stars and the sun and the moon are, and he made the earth. So he made this, everything, what we would call the cosmos, the, the, the solar furnaces, the myriads of galaxies and all that, almost, I mean, if you read Genesis 1, it's amazing. It says he made the sun to rule by day and the moon to rule by night, and he made the stars also made the stars also. He gives four words to something that numbers in the octillions at the least. I mean, a number beyond what we can understand of, of stars and galaxies of stars. And he only devotes four words to that. Now, is God saying something there? He talks about every inch of this place. The dirt, the water, the, the sky for birds to fly through. And the, in Job, he talks about how he laid the foundations and how he put together all the layers of the earth and how it's balanced and everything else. God really makes a differentiation. He minimalizes this is the, the minimum, you could say, four words. And he makes a maximum emphasis on the earth. So that's the Genesis account. Now look at Colossians real quickly. Um, and, and when you're processing this, one of the fun things to do when you're, when you're trying to biblically answer something is you look at everything the Bible says about it and you classify it and find the key points that the Lord makes. And this is, this is one of the key ones. Starting in Colossians 1, and, and this I mentioned this morning, this is from the fundamentals, one of the key verses about creationism. But it says, uh, Jesus, that's in verse 15. Be, how do we know it's Jesus? Because if you, if you back up, it's the one that redeemed us by his blood in verse 14. Uh, and uh, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. It's Christ who, who so we know it's Christ from 14. And then it says in verse 15, he, the, the Christ, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. Now pause for just a minute. The only God you'll ever see is Jesus. Have you thought about that? The only God you'll ever see. There's one God in three persons. The one you see that's invisible, physical, corporeal form, a body. God doesn't have a body. God the Father doesn't have a body. He's an infinite spirit. The Holy Spirit is an infinite spirit. Jesus Christ is an infinite spirit that became incarnated, has a body. So just process that. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. And Hebrews 11 tells us that, that he is the exact representation of God. And John 1 tells us that too. And so Jesus is, if you want to see God the Father, Jesus said, look at me. And just take him at his word because that's who we see. And he's the image of the invisible God. So God is invisible and if you see God, it's Jesus. He is the firstborn over all creation. And, and that's fascinating. Where, uh, just as a side view, when Paul talks about Christ being the head, and when he talks about him being the, the prototokos and all that, we do mathematics different than the, the Greeks. We do mathematics where you do a number, a number, a number, you draw a line, and this is the sum. I'm not doing tic-tac-toe here, by the way. If we're adding together, we put the sum where? At the bottom. But yet, when we go to the summit of a mountain, is that at the bottom? 
Isn't that interesting? That that is, that is a misnomer. Some in Greek mathematics, they would have their list of things that were being added together and they put the sum at the top. So when it says that Jesus is the prototokos, he is the sum, the total, the head, the height, the highest of all the creation that he made, and he stands over it all as the firstborn. He is the one that God placed as he became incarnate as the Son of God, as the head over all creation. It doesn't mean he was the first created being. That's Jehovah's Witnessism, and it's false. It's heretical. But he stands as the sum. Jesus is the sum of all that is. He, he well, look, what it, he defines it right here. Uh, by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth. Now, did you notice what we're kind of sinking with here? Jesus, so, so God, Genesis says God created, but Paul clarifies God who? God the Son is the creator. So Jesus Christ is the creator. And he created the heavens and the earth. And, and notice, so it's sinking that we're talking about the same event. Uh, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Now, the more astrophysics goes, we have found out that more of the universe is invisible than is visible. That's what they call the black matter and black energy and black holes and all this stuff. Most of the mass of the universe, you know, they've calculated the mass of the universe. It's 10 to the 36th power or something, I don't know, some astronomical, unbelievable number. But the majority of it is invisible. And look who knew that. You know, someone asked me this morning, they said, well, there was a time when the church thought that the earth was flat. I said, yeah, the church did think that, but God didn't. God never said the earth is flat. He said it's, that the earth rotates, hangs upon nothing, and, and it runs on an axis. God says that in the book of Job. It spins on an axis. And, and, it's, and it's a sphere. God said the earth was round. He never said it was flat. And he never said that the sun rotated around the earth. The medieval church thought that, and, and Greeks thought that, but God never states that. But notice what God did say. The things that are visible and the things that are invisible. There's all kinds of parts of this universe that, that are invisible, and now we're starting to understand that. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And by the way, when we get to these thrones and dominions and principalities and powers, all of a sudden we've, we've lopped over into part of what God made back here is what we would call the whole angelic realm. I mean, we know very little about the angelic realm. It appears, if you look at every verse, it appears that there are seven orders. You can find seven orders of bad angels. And Paul talks about them. He says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principles principalities and powers, and spiritual wickedness in high places. And Jude adds to that, uh, he, he, he calls them by other names. And so there are seven orders of bad angels and good angels. And you know some of the good ones. There's normal angels, and there's archangels, and there are burning angels, seraphs, and there are living angels, cherubs, and, and there are archangels, which are high ones like Michael and archangels. So there are all these types of angels. But part of what Genesis doesn't talk about, but Paul adds, is this part, the angelic realm, the principalities and powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, before not only as the initiator, but, but standing as head over them because it says this, and verse 17, in him all things consist. You know, if you know basic, uh, basic 
what you learn in physics class is that like charges, what? What do like charges do? There we go. We've got a physicist. I know the voice, Dale. I hear you. Where? Yeah, there we go. We have a physics teacher here, an astrophysicist, but they repel. Why in the nucleus can you have like charged particles and they don't explode and the universe dissolve? Well, the clearest for us normal people that don't understand quantum mechanics, look what it says. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Now, that's Colossians 1, that Jesus made the heavens, the earth, the angelic uh, realm, and of course, part of earth, totally tied to earth. In fact, humans are made initially from the dust of the stars? No. What? From dirt, you know? From, from the soil, from the ground of that planet, of the truly what God calls the center of the universe. God even positions his throne over the earth. So the reason that the medieval church said that everything rotated around the earth was not a statement of the solar system as much as a reflection that God sits enthroned over Mount Zion, which happens to be in Jerusalem. So actually, the earth is the center of the universe because God's throne is there, and Jerusalem is the center of the center. It's very interesting when you calculate everything that God talks about. But here is the fascinating portion. Now look at Second Peter with me because I want to show you something. Uh, God has a, a, a countdown clock going, and uh, Second Peter 3 um, is a fascinating passage. Uh, first of all, the Lord in 2 Peter 3 uh, talks about the, the creation of the world, the first five verses. For this they willfully forget, verse 5 of 2 Peter 3, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in water. Oh, ho, Peter has the same cosmology, the same creationistic viewpoint. So Moses had it, Jesus, I mean, Paul had it. Of course, Jesus had it because he did it. And now Peter has it. So they all agree with this, that the heavens, created with only four words, actually one word, God said, you know, come into existence, but four words describe it, and the earth. It doesn't say, and, and all the planets and all the people groups and all the various binary stars that have yellow suns so they can have life. You know how they're always, the scientists are looking out there and they're saying, oh, there's another one that could support life. Really? Now there's something that, did you know that it's called the anthropic principle? Did you know that, that there are 21 precise measurements that make life possible? Here's the sun and here's the earth. If the earth was any closer to the sun, any closer, we'd boil off. If we were any further, we would freeze. It's at the exact right place. If the earth wasn't tilted exactly the right way, the weather here would be worse than it is, okay? We would have, we'd all live in Oklahoma, okay? Not just the people in Oklahoma. I mean, d the speed of, of our the, the orbit of, I mean, the rotation of the earth, everything, even the mix, you know, the 78, 22 mix of the, of the atmosphere here, the proportion of water, not to water, those, there are actually 21 that astrophysicists have worked out, 25 anthropic. In other words, what that's saying is that, that the earth was designed just for humans by somebody. And to find out there another place that has all of those factors, even the luminosity of the sun, the fact that it is a yellow sun and not a red, not a blue, not a white, not a brown, you know, all the different types of stars that the Bible talks about, by the way. The Bible says there are different, there are different types of stars. 
I mean, the Bible's very advanced in astrophysics and everything else. But look what Peter says. He says, oh, so God made the heavens of old, verse 5, and the earth standing out of water and in the water. Now look at verse 6. Always tied to creationism is this global flood. And both of those are disparaged by the majority of people who say they're Christians. Biblical creationism is disparaged by 98% of all Christian colleges in America. They don't believe in it. And so is the global flood, which, by the way, God believed in both because he did it, and all the, all the authors of Scripture believed in both. And Peter says it right here. By which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water, 2 Peter 3, 6. And he continues in verse 7, the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So what he's saying is, Peter, you know, affirms the creation account. He adds to it the f global flood. It's not a local, it's a global, the world, the whole world, not Anatolia or Mesopotamia or the Black Sea like that uh, fellow that found the Titanic said that the global flood was just around the Black Sea, whatever his name is, because he found evidence he thought of the global flood. I mean of the local flood. It's not local, it's global. But Peter also says one more thing. Notice what he says. Verse 7, the heavens and the earth, same cosmology. The heavens and the earth, he's said it before, but here it is again. The heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, right here, he spoke them into existence. A very consistent creationistic cosmology. By the same word, the word that Colossians 1.17, Paul says, Jesus Christ holds everything together. He, by the word of his power, he, he just said, matter, nuclei, you're going to hold together, I'm going to keep this universe together, are held together by the same word, but they're reserved, verse 7, for fire. They're reserved for fire. How long? Until the day of judgment. That's when the fire is going to come. And perdition of ungodly men. Now, Peter adds something. He says, the universe, the universe, the cosmos, this and this, the geos, the earth, geos and cosmos, these are reserved. The universe is waiting, reserved, it's waiting for a fiery destruction. The whole thing, and I'm going to show it to you in a second, all of it is going to burn up. For a fiery destruction predicated on one thing. This is what Peter adds, mankind. Those higher intelligences, those images of God that God created, and, and there is no room in the scriptures for any other life forms, because if so, God is certainly neglecting them. He is focusing everything, the cross, the work of the angels, the angels are watching over humans. See, anything, any other life forms out there in the universe, there's not any room for them in the scriptures. Now, of course, you can make, a lot of people's theology is from the white spaces. The black spaces are the words, the print. Their theology is, is from the white spaces. They insert here and there. But if you really read this, Moses, Paul, and Peter thought mankind is the center of God's focus. There's the earth, which is the center of the universe from God's perspective. And there's this massive universe around us that God only devotes four words to. But look what's going to happen to it. It says, don't forget this, verse 8, this thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. 
what does that mean? It means that, that God is standing above. He is on a different dimension than we are. We're bound by four dimensions. The, the physical dimensions of length and breadth and depth, and then the, the, the fourth dimension of time. And we can't get out of that. I mean, we can fly different places, but time is still, it, it slows down or speeds up depending on your speed, but we're still bound by it, by all these laws of the physical universe. God is above that. And, and it says in the, the book of Isaiah that God sees the end from the beginning. He sees all of it at once. For God, the physical universe is flat. And it's all, it's like a flat screen TV. Although I don't think God would watch television, you know, because he's got better things to do. But to him, the universe is like a flat screen TV. He sees everything going on, the ending that we're going to read about, and the beginning, which he initiated. He sees it all at the same time. And so to him, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. What does that mean? It means time doesn't impact God at all. It doesn't mean that we can say that one day in Genesis is like two billion years. That's not what it's saying. But look, look what he's talking about. Verse 9, the Lord isn't slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness, but he's long-suffering. He's, he's waiting many days, many thousands of years, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, I'm not going to go into, you know, the, the two views of that. But basically what the Lord is saying is he's waiting for the full fullness of those who are going to be saved to be saved. And then look at this. Here is verse 10. But the day of the Lord. Now day of the Lord is code. All the way through the Old Testament, day of Lord is code for what we would call the end of days involving the second coming, involving the tribulation, the time of Jacob's troubles. It's the whole book of Joel is about the day of the Lord. It's just day of the Lord, day of the Lord. It's the day of his wrath and all that. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Remember the movie, Thief in the Night? There it is. Only that was talking about the rapture, and this isn't. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements, that word stoike, speaks about what we would say the atomic level. To the Greek language, it was the smallest, the foundational elements, the smallest particles. We would call it the subatomic, the atomic and subatomic. The, the elements will melt with fervent heat. Wow. Both the earth and the works in it will be burned up. But, it, but you notice it says the heavens, the universe, what, what I think happens is the Lord that's holding everything together, Colossians 1.17, pulls the pin. He goes, okay, I'm not going to hold together anymore. And the whole universe dissolves. So if there are other life forms out there, they have a short life expectancy because only mankind is redeemed by Christ. And only mankind... And the angelic realm and God survive this fiery destruction. Because look what it says. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, verse 11, what manner of persons ought you to be? Looking forward, verse 12, and hastening the coming of the day of God. How do we do that? We lead people to the Lord. Did you know there's like a clicker? You know, counting off. And when the last one that God has chosen, boom. You know, lead people to the Lord. It'll hasten the coming of the day of God. Because of which the heavens will be dissolved. That's the second time it says that. That's the whole universe. Both the visible and the invisible will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, according to his promise, we look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And you could go on and on reading that. Basically, Peter has the same cosmology, and Peter says the entire universe is waiting. And, and just, if, if you want to study this more, it's fascinating. Romans 8, Paul adds that the universe right now is groaning 
under the bondage of what we would call the laws of thermodynamics, the, the, the gradual heat death that the universe is going through. You know, the second law, and all the laws are, are keyed to this idea of winding down and going toward destruction. So all of that is coming, but what we're looking for is this new heaven, verse 13, and new earth. So let's go there, and let's, that's where I'll end. Uh, and I'm so glad that uh, you asked this question because you let me think about it. Uh, but look at, at chapter 4 and 5 of Revelation. And the last thing I want to show you is, um, why do we say that, that there, is, there are no other aliens out there and other planets and other places where people are? Because everything is going to be destroyed. The only thing that's going to last is there is a heaven that's where God's throne is, and there's a hell, which is the, member. hell uh, in English comes from the word Gehenna or Gehenna, or the valley of Hinnom, the garbage dump of Hinnom, which is a valley that's on the west side of Jerusalem. And it's where the people in the city of Jerusalem, they were a walled on a hilltop city, and they would take their trash and they'd push it over the edge and it would tumble down and they would throw old donkeys that died, bloated and, you know, rotting. They'd push them down there and they'd push all their junk, you know, their appliances and old cars and tires over the walls, you know, just like we do nowadays. And they'd push it all down there and there was a perpetual fire at the bottom of the hill. It was kind of like smoldering. And, and there were also maggots and everything else. Can you think all the garbage going there and stuff burning? I remember we used to go to the dump when I was little. The dump. What a, you know, what a place to go. And that's where everybody threw their trash. And I used to love going to the dump. While my dad was unloading the car, I was scampering around looking for treasures, you know. And, and many treasures would be found. You know, one man's junk is somebody else's treasure. But I remember that dump looked like hell. I mean, it was garbage and things rotting and they were burning parts and they would bulldoze parts. Hell is the garbage dump of the universe that God is going to send all those who bear his image, humans, that rejected their creator and he's going to send all, it was originally built for, Jesus said, the devil and his angels. God, by the way, never predestined anyone to hell. He doesn't say that. Theology says that. God doesn't say that. God predestined no one to hell. But when the devil fell in the rebellion, he said, I'm creating hell for you. So Satan has always known where he's going. And that's why he can't believe that God is going to let him loose and, and do what he wants to do through the Antichrist on earth. He's so excited and he's so dumb he thinks he's going to win. But look who's in heaven. When, when we get to heaven, in chapter 4, you've all seen this, the thrones and, and all the, the voices. Look at verse 10. There are 24 elders who fall down, and, and they say, you, verse 11, are worthy to receive. You created all things. So we get the creation piece in heaven. Then you get to chapter 5, and when you look at chapter 5, look at verse 8. When he took the scroll, that's the title deed to the universe that Satan has usurped and that He's the God of this world, and Jesus is, is, God says, you're the creator. God the Father says to God the Son, you're the creator. You're the rightful owner. You can now, I have waited thousands of years, you can now take back the universe that Romans 8 says is groaning, awaiting the redemption. The whole universe knows its creator. By the way, it says he came unto his own, and his own received him not. He came to his own universe, which completely received Christ. When Jesus spoke to a tree, it withered. When Jesus spoke to the ocean, I mean to the Sea of Galilee, when Jesus spoke to the wind, every creature obeyed him except the humans. Even the demons obeyed him instantly. The, the universe knows, and it's groaning, it's waiting. It knows it's in bondage to sin. It's waiting for the time that's coming. But look, look who is in heaven. When he took the scroll, the four living creatures, those are angelic, the 24 elders representing humans. How do we know they represent humans? Because it says we were redeemed. Who did Jesus redeem? Romans 5 tells us. He only redeemed the descendants of Adam. 
That's why you be careful if your theology doesn't have an Adam and an Eve. If you have an evolutionary view, what, where is Adam? Which Adam? Which humanoid became Adam that God created directly? I mean, and, and, you know, we don't need to go into that, but look what it says in verse 9. They sang a new song. That's the redeemed. That's humans. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seal, for you were slain, and look who's in heaven. In heaven is God, the angels who did not rebel, and one other group. You have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe, not planet, out of every tongue, not solar system, out of every people and nation. God presents to us that the earth is the center of his redemptive focus, that the earth is where he's put all of his attention, that Jesus ever lives to intercede for those that bear the image of God that he created and breathed the life into and made living spirits and created them in his image. Those are the ones he ever lives to intercede for, us who are redeemed. And those are the ones he came to die for. And those are who are in heaven, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign. What's the center of the universe? What does it say in verse 10? Where shall we reign? On the earth. See, there's, there's going to be a new, in fact, now turn to chapter 21, and notice what happens after the big burn. Between Revelation 20 uh, and, uh, and Revelation 21, between Revelation 20 and 21 is inserted 2 Peter 3. It goes right there. That is the great burn of the universe. And then look what happens in verse 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there is no more sea. What's, what's the, what is God focusing on? It's the same thing at the end as it was at the beginning. God says that in the beginning was God. And then God, from nothing, created everything, heavens, which are defying our, I mean, at the creation, if you've ever been to the Answers in Genesis Creation Museum, their little planetarium is one of the most phenomenal things to sit there and finally understand how big the universe is. They just keep doing these exponential, you know, you're in the earth and then you go to the solar system, then you go to our galaxy and then... And all of a sudden, you've gone so many times, you say, this, I can't fit all that in my mind. But God not only fit it in his mind, he named all the stars, calls them all by name, and they obey him. But he's going to burn all that up and burn all this up, and he's going to end up with a new heaven and a new earth, not Alderaan, you know, not wherever, you know, uh, the, the science fiction people have it and everyone who is not redeemed who are in heaven are going to be in hell for as long as everybody's in heaven and that's that's the simple cosmology that God consistently from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 presents the same thing isn't that amazing now it doesn't mean that after we're in heaven, that, that God's going to make more of whatever. In fact, I think that, that we already know what's going to be like in heaven because in a fallen world, this is a pretty neat place. I mean, don't you love the taste of food? Don't you like the feel of the wind? Don't you like the colors of the sunset? Don't you like the complexity of stuff that grows and at, at every level, macro and micro? It's all beautiful and symmetrical in 1 Corinthians 14, orderly. God is a God of order. And so I, I believe that probably we will never come to the end of all that he's going to make. And, and since God invented eating, since God invented sexual relations, can you imagine how wonderful heaven's going to be? I mean, everything we experience is fallen, cursed, under bondage. Can you imagine 
how wonderful. You, you think of the best things you've ever known in life. Heaven is better by far, exponentially better. We've never experienced perfection. We've seen it in Christ. We have never experienced it. And, and in that moment when we get there, we're going to be in his image. He's purchased us. We're going to worship him. But a lot of people are worried in heaven. They're all they're going to do is play their harp, you know, and sit on a cloud. That's not in the Bible. It says we're going to be serving him. And how did we serve him on earth? Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it to God's glory. Heaven's going to be like that. Whatever we do, traveling to, you know, whatever. God just made a new solar system over there or a new galaxy or another parallel universe. You go over there, we serve him to his glory. It's very exciting. Revelation 12, that's where we're going to start today. Uh, what we would like to do is keep Christ's perspective on the cosmic war that's raging every day. Now, have you already covered the book of Job yet? They were doing Job down in Florida. Have you done Job yet? No. Uh, Job is a parallel book to the book of Revelation. In fact, much of what we see going on in Job 1 and 2 is what we're seeing in chapter 12. And remember I told you there are 404 verses in the book of Revelation, but 800 quotations, allusions, and imagery drawing from 800 other passages of Scripture. This is one of them. Uh, basically, if we put it in 21st century kind of uh, movie language, we would write this, and it's in your notes. Above the softness of our blue-green planet, there are hostile forces poised. They range across space, lurking and flying about, doing their master's biddings. They are former angels. They are Satan the dragon's army. They are deadly, vile, malignant, and very intelligent. By the way, the, the name of these creatures means intelligence, demon. These aliens to our planet are highly skilled, incredibly powerful, we saw that yesterday, usually invisible warriors. Demons can hear us talk, can pass through walls, can fly through space, can inhabit human and animal bodies. I had a friend that was an Arizona State Trooper. It was kind of gross, so if you don't like gross stuff, don't listen. Uh, but he was in the Arizona State Highway Patrolman, and he was one of my students. He had retired and went to Bible school. And he said that, uh, that they did a drug bust on the highway, a caravan, you know, uh, you know how they're always ferrying drugs from wherever they take them to the metro areas, and they were getting them going to L.A. And he said, this guy came out of the car, and the, the highway patrolman was wearing his vest like they're supposed to, and just came right out of the car and started shooting, and boom, 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 hitting the vest, which is painful, but he was making it. Well, these highway patrolmen uh, doing drug bust had shotguns. And so, you know, as he was being shot, he went, you know, started pumping his shotgun. And he said that that guy coming out of the car took, I mean, it was just like, it really looked like one of the action movies, which always are so fake. He said that, that he kept shooting. He emptied his six shells, and that guy never stopped coming. And he said that his eyes his face, the sounds coming out of his mouth. He said, this was not human. Anybody that's in law enforcement and in medical uh, fields have encountered humans that something else is. Uh, I remember early on there was um, a movie, um, Men in Black, and there was this monster that came inside of a human and their eyes would blink inside of the eyes of the human. And it, it scared them because they could see there was something inside of them. That's science fiction. This is true. Demons can invade and indwell and take over humans and animals. And in Jesus' ministry, he encountered non-stop writhing, foaming, thrashing, chattering, monster activity demonized people. The demons trying to kill the humans. And so this is going on. These extraterrestrial beings can take on various forms that look human, look powerful, look fearsome. They are watching over the realm of the serpent and his seed. You can see 
We saints of God are at war. See, what I want you to realize is, whether you like it or not, it doesn't matter if you're going to be a missionary or a pastor or a youth pastor or going to full-time work or just be a normal, I met a radiologist yesterday, I met an uh, airline person who wants to be an airline pilot, I met someone who wants to be a videographer, and a lot of in-between. It doesn't matter if you're a born-again Christian, you're at war. You are in the battle. Why? Because if you're born again, you're an enemy to Satan. You and I have the Holy Spirit. He can see that. He can see the seal of the Spirit on us. The demons can too, and they are very much wanting to do anything they can to oppose us. So let's see what they can do. Let's scan Revelation 12. Now remember I told you yesterday that chapter 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 are called the parenthetical chapters, and they cover what theologians call mysteries. Now, a mystery is not a scary thing we don't know anything about. It's a truth that God doesn't reveal until it's here. It, the things revealed in chapter 10 through chapter 15 are not fully explained anywhere else in the Bible. This is amazing. A great sign appeared in heaven. So that means it's a sign. That means now we're getting into signs of, of something that means something else. So what that means is there is a woman clothed with a sun. Women don't wear the sun. You know what I mean? The, the sun is a star. So this is a, an image. This is visual. This is a picturesque part of Revelation. Most people think the whole book's that way. It's not. Most of it is absolutely literal. This is a sign. It's a picture. And this woman clothed with the sun, with the moon, under her feet and on her head, a garland of 12 stars, immediately makes all of us who are Bible readers say, I've read this somewhere else in the Bible, right? You all have. This is the, the vision, the dream that Joseph had that he shared with Jacob, his father, and his 11 brothers. This is a picture of Israel. And, and so, you know, I mean, if you read Genesis, you can see this. And being with child, she, she was in labor and pain and gave birth, and another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. <laughs> Boy, that sounds, and now we're in the Lord of the Rings, you know, uh, the dragon or whatever his name was. I mean, it's just like, and that's where people get derailed. They say, can this be, what is going on here? This is a sign, this is a picture, and it's going to be explained, and it is explained by God. Verse 4, his tail drew a third part of the stars from heaven, he threw them to the earth. The dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born, and she bore a male child. Now we're getting to the book of Psalms. This is Psalm 2. For those of you that, that read the Bible a lot, it immediately jumps out. That's going to rule with a rod of iron? That's exactly what Psalm 2 says Jesus Christ would do. And so we're tracking with John recording the revelation of God that is tying together hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other portions of Scripture. So obviously this child, this male child in verse 5, is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He's the one coming to rule with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God in his throne. And so basically, and I won't read the whole chapter, you've already read it, it's part of your assignment, but basically this is saying that Satan is opposing Israel trying to stop Jesus Christ's birth. That's what this whole 12th chapter is about. It actually starts back in verse 19. If you look at chapter 11, verse 19, and so the temple of God is open in verse 19, uh, actually, that's a whole new paragraph starting. And in heaven, and the Ark of the Covenant was seen, and there's thunderings and lightnings and great hail, and a great sign appeared. See, all, it's chapter 11, verse 19 is actually the first verse, should be, of chapter 12, is all I'm saying. And what is it saying? That there is victory. You see, God is orchestrating this. God knew that the dragon was going to try and devour the child. So, God is aware of the battle going on. That's why the Bible says, greater is he that is in you, what? Than he that is in the world. We are more than what? Conquerors through Christ. Uh, I'm persuaded neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities. Angels, good angels, principalities, bad angels. Nothing can separate us from God's love. That's what this chapter is about. That's the way that we face 
the battle that Satan is going to wage against us, especially the one word Jesus repeated more than any other when Jesus talks about the end. Remember, he talks about the end in Matthew 24. But the word that he describes the end of the world by is the word deception. He says that's the, the number one problem believers are going to have is the deception that Satan tries to deceive them with in their minds. So where we are in chapter 12 is right in the middle of this section on the tribulation events. Uh, do you remember, basically, we have the church age, uh, the time when Christ is working through his church, that's right now, and the church age ends when he takes his church out and the tribulation begins. And so we've seen that progression uh, with the church, point one, with Christ's church all of a sudden being in heaven. So around the throne, we find the church there. And so the church has been transported upward and the tribulation begins. And so that's what we're in the middle of in chapter 12. Now, chapter 12 tells us God's amazing plan. Now look at the first two verses. Now a great sign. Now immediately, a sign is a sign. It's kind of like a logo. Uh, you guys have uh, logos on some of your, uh, like I see uh, on your tennis shoes or your running shoes, you know, I see ends, you know, uh, New Balance, and I see, I don't know what that one is, and I see, I guess Nike is not popular anymore. But you know, I mean, the sign of the company. Is that swoosh sign Nike? No, it's the sign, it's the picture, it represents. So this is a sign, it's a representation. And the great sign, verse one, appeared in heaven, and now we get this amazing list of characters. A woman clothed with the sun, a human clothed with a star that's on fire with thermonuclear fusion, right? No, it's a picture of a woman that's glowing, that, that has this glowing like the sun. Uh, the moon is under her feet, and on her head is a garland of 12 stars. Immediately, you think of where that is in the Bible. Where is that story of the sun, moon, and stars, and all that stuff? Now we're getting into Joseph's dream with his brothers. Do you remember that? This is exact, see, every part of the Bible is reflected in Revelation. Revelation connects all the verses of all the other books and they come in different places in this book. So we're gonna see that more. Then, being with child, verse two, she cried out in labor and in pain gave birth. Wow, so that's, that's Satan versus Israel is introduced here. And by the way, the woman uh, is, is portraying you know, Israel through whom the Messiah came and the child being born is Christ. That's Satan's plan. And the, the, the way that he's been fighting God is what we're gonna look like, or, or look at. But first of all, let's look at Satan's origin. Uh, it says in, in verse, um, well, I'll read verse three. Another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads, ten horns, seven diadems or crowns on his head. And look at verse four. His tail, that's this, this dragon, fiery red dragon, his tail drew one third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Now wait a minute. What are stars? I know, they're, they're, they're thermonuclear furnaces out there. But in the Bible, what are stars representing? Now we go to the book of Job. Job says that the, the sons of God, the stars sang at creation. This is talking about the angels. The angels were considered to be, um, in metaphoric terms, like stars. And so Satan is drawing a third. Do you remember my chart yesterday that all angels and a third of them rebelled? I showed you that in angelology. That's the event in verse four. Satan takes one-third of all 
the angels. Now, Satan has many names in the Bible, and in this chapter, they're all going to be linked together. He is called Lucifer. That's before he fell into sin, the son of the morning. Then he is called Satan, the adversary. He's called the devil, who is the slanderer. He is called the dragon, here. And he is called the serpent of old. When would that be from? Garden of Eden, right? Eve getting deceived by the serpent. And so these are the, the roster of his name. So in verse 4, um, Satan is, is the one that leads the rebellion. Now, you notice I give you two passages. Isaiah 14. Now, if you want to turn there, uh, I'll never forget, I was sitting in class like you in 1970-something, uh, when your parents were little, and uh, I remember the professor saying to me, for the rest of your life, you will be thankful for what I'm going to tell you now. And I thought, he's an old guy. I wonder if he knows what he's talking about. You know, I mean, I didn't say that, but I thought, he knows something that's going to help me for the rest of my life. And I was sitting in Bible class, and he said, for the rest of your life, people around you are going to wonder where Satan or the devil came from. And I'm going to show you so you know for the rest of your life where Satan came from. And he told us, he said, turn to two different passages. And he said, uh, I want you to always remember these two. And it's Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. So I took my notes on paper before electronics, kind of like some of you are writing on paper. And I listened, and do you know what? That was in 1975, so that was 25, 35, 44 years ago. I have never forgotten that elderly, 80-year-old Bible teacher's lesson. Because he's right. This, every time I post on YouTube anything about Satan, thousands and thousands and thousands of views. Thousands. These are unsafe people. You ought to read their comments. They say, you talk out of your four-letter word. You know, they just are very vile and vulgar, but they're fascinated by where Satan, the devil, and the demons. Why? Because that's the God of this world, and they're aware of his influence. So, where did Satan come from? First of all, Isaiah 14. Look at verse 12. Oh, how you are fallen from heaven. Now, what does your Bible say next? Oh, what? Yeah, oh, Lucifer, son of the morning. Now, in America, long ago, matches, you know, those are little sticks with sulfur on the end that you scrape and they start on fire. Do you know what they were called? Lucifers. Because they would spring to light. I mean, isn't that funny? Old-fashioned, uh, uh, probably your grandparents would have heard of that. But Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said, now this is really important, verse 13, why and how did Satan fall from being Lucifer? This is, this is God's revelation of that to us. For you have said in your heart, he didn't say it out loud. This is what the greatest creation of God thought inside of himself. Now, think about that for a minute. God is listening to your thoughts, and they matter to God. That's why we're supposed to be speaking the truth to ourselves. In fact, a little bit later today, I'm going to show you, you should be preaching the gospel to yourself. You should be reminding yourself. You don't just preach the gospel to the kids you're trying to lead to Christ. You need to preach it to yourself, too. Remind yourself of what Christ did. Sometimes we only think of salvation that way, that people need it. We need it. We need to understand it. We need to walk in it and believe in it. So what we say to ourselves matters to God. And Lucifer said, I will ascend into heaven, verse 13. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. What is this stars thing? Remember, in the metaphor of the Bible, when it talks about stars, uh, it's, it represents, I mean, when it's not talking about 
the sun, moon, and stars, usually stars are representatives of, of God. And this metaphor, the stars, are the angels. So I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, the angels. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Now look at the end of verse 14. For me, this is one of the greatest proofs of inspiration. If a human was writing this, not God inspiring it, they would have Satan say in verse 14, I will be greater than the Most High. See, if, if someone was usurping you, like uh, trying to take your place, a sports person, they wouldn't say, you know, like when uh, someone wants to beat Michael Jordan's basketball record, they don't say, I'm going to be like Michael Jordan. They say, I'm going to be what? Better, greater. I'm going to do more than him in basketball. You guys ever heard of him? He used to play basketball a long time ago. I don't know the modern ones that, that you would know. But you know what I mean. What did Satan say? Not that I'm going to be greater than God. Why? Because God is greater than the sum of everything he created, and Satan is just one being that God created. Satan knows who God is. Satan knows nothing, no one is greater than God. Now think what that means to your life today, sitting here at Word of Life in this little room in the Bible Institute. God lives inside of me. And God lives inside of whom? You. Right? You're his temple. Demons, Satan, all the forces of darkness, when they come up and see you, you know who they see looking out at them? They don't see Lydia. They look right past Lydia. They see who's inside of Bella. Who's inside of Bella? Greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world, right? That's what John said. What is he talking about? God is in me. And Satan knows he can't be greater than God. And so he said, I will be like the Most High. Satan became Satan and the devil and the dragon and the serpent. He fell from being the highest leader of worship in heaven and God's greatest creative being because he wanted to be like God. And what did he tempt Eve with? He said, if you follow me, you will be like God too. That was his temptation. This idea that, that you can have what all Eastern, you guys are, or you're Orientals, many of you, Eastern religion, Hinduism, and Buddhism, and all these, Shintoism, all this, are emanations of Satan's lies that you can, like take the Hindus, you can reincarnate until you ascend to be like a God. Guess what? The instant I was saved, I became a son of God. I became the dwelling place of God. I become a reflection of God. I have God's spirit filling me. I have all the fullness of the Godhead bodily living inside of me. I didn't get part of God. I didn't get a little, you know, kind of like a pinch you know, that's what they say in cooking, a pinch of salt, you know, just a little bit, a dusting. I got all of him. Now, he doesn't have all of me. I don't know if he has all of you. Because salvation is much like the rooms in a house. The Lord moves in, but we lock some doors. You know, when, when someone comes to visit you, there are parts of, you know, your stuff you don't want them to see. You know, you kind of hide it or you put it in your pocket or... You know, a lot of people don't want someone rummaging through their phone or their computer or their drawers like your little brother. You don't want him looking in your stuff. That's how we are as, as Christians. We, don't, we have parts of our life we don't want the Lord to have. And he wants all of us. We got all of him. He wants all of us. That's what surrender is. Okay, look at what it says. Verse 15, And you shall be brought down to Sheol, that's the grave, to the lowest depth of the pit. Remember I told you the pit? Remember there is Sheol. That's the Hebrew word for grave. And the pit is where, it's a synonymous term, and the pit 
is where every human being is alive right now that's ever lived. The Pharaoh that looked at Moses and defied God is there today, conscious and remembering Moses. You understand that? The Mongol warriors that tried to conquer Jeju in 12, what was it, 1207? The Mongols tried to conquer this island and kind of did. Uh, they are in the pit right now, alive and remembering, fighting on this island. Do you understand? Everybody that's ever lived is still alive, and they're all in the grave if they're not in the presence of the Lord because they're a believer. So that's what happened to Satan. But keep tur turning from Isaiah to Ezekiel. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel 28. Same story. Starts in verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre. You go, wait a minute, king of Tyre? I thought we were talking about Satan. Satan, Satan empowers earthly kings to do things, his bidding, and at that particular moment, the king of Tyre was one of his favorite servants. So Ezekiel is inspired by God to talk about this very proud, arrogant king and I saw, I saw um, one of your teachers was talking about prophetic foreshadowing. It was in one of your classes, I was sitting here, where, I don't remember which one, whether it was Dr. Ivy or, or Felipe, where God talks about, you know, these two events, and you don't see the distance between them. It's called prophetic foreshadowing. I saw it in your notes. But, also, God sometimes talks about an earthly person and shows the, what Satan is doing behind him and talks to this earthly person, but he's really talking about Satan. You all know about one. When Jesus looked at Peter and said, get thee behind me, Satan, was Peter Satan? Do you remember that in the, in the, last, in the countdown to the cross? When Peter told Jesus, that will never happen to you, you will never be crucified. And Jesus looked right at Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. What was he talking about? It was Satan empowering Peter to say bad things. In the New Testament, Paul said, every time we gossip, do you guys know what gossip is? Gossip is the surrender of our tongue to the devil. His name is slanderer. Gossip is slander. When we tell something, if I say, could I tell you something about Leo? <laughs> It'll really embarrass him, but I want you to know. I have started to gossip. I'm telling something that I'm neither a part of the solution or the problem, and I'm telling it only to harm someone. That's what gossip is. Have you heard, and that's usually how it happens at church. People come up at church and say, Javaris, have you heard what the pastor did? Have you heard? And see, that's what Satan is good at. He's good at sowing discord among saints through slander. So Peter was saying something that Satan wanted him to say, and so the Lord addresses Satan. The king of Tyre, this king, in verse 12 is doing Satan's bidding. So this is what the Lord says to him. You are the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect and beauty. That's what Satan was like. He was the wisest and most beautiful creature God made. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. So, so Satan is a beautiful creature. Um, and continuing in verse 13 at the end, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes were prepared for you on the day you were created. Satan was involved, according to the Hebrew language, these are musical terms. Satan has always been involved with music. Boy, that should make you cautious. There is good music, there is bad music. Music can make words never leave your mind. Things put to music right on our minds in an unusual way, and for the rest of your life, when you hear that tune, the lyrics come, just like that. That is part of what Satan is good at. And there are many people that know more lyrics to unsaved pagan people's songs than they know 
verses from the Bible. If you wrote down all the lyrics you know of all the music, it would count as hundreds of Bible verses worth of lyrics. Yet I ask Christians all the time, how many verses do you have memorized? And they go, uh, not very many. How many lyrics do you have memorized? Oh, uh, a lot. See, Satan wants to do anything to get us away from having the Word of God written on our mind. Remember, he's involved with music. Now look at verse 14. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You are on the holy mountain of God. You walk back and forth in the fiery stones. Now he, as Lucifer, Satan was the anointed. Now look at what he is. Cherub. Do you remember way back when I was drawing the picture of the throne of God? I said there were these four creatures. They have four faces. They're covered with eyes. They have six wings. And they always are flying. Remember I had the throne of God. These creatures are always flying around the throne, the four of them. What are they called? Cherubs. Satan was the anointed. He was the highest cherub. So you know what that means? We know what Satan looks like. He doesn't wear red tights and have a pointy tail. He has four faces, a square head, and he's covered with eyes. He's highly intelligent and very powerful. And then uh, it talks about it, verse 17, you were lifted up because of your beauty and all this, and, and it, it continues talking about the king of Tyre. Okay, that's Satan's origin and activity. Now let's look back in Revelation at what happens to him. Revelation 12. Now remember, for the rest of your life, if anybody uh, asks you about the devil, demons, and uh, Satan, you know where the Bible describes that for the rest of your life. But look at Revelation 12, starting in verse 7. And it says, let me get to verse 7. And war broke out in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, that's Satan, and the dragon and his angels fought. Verse 8, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Now, I don't have time to tell you this fully, but right now Satan, remember, chapter 12 hasn't happened yet. Chapter 12, this battle is in the future. Remember, it's, it's in the tribulation. Right now Satan is allowed to come in front of God's throne today. And he says, do you know what Kirsten did today? And Jesus said, yes, I do. She's one of my children. Do you know what Isaac did today? Do you know what John did today? Did you know Satan is the accuser of the brethren, the Bible says? That means every time we sin, not every one of us all the time, but every time we do something that comes up on Satan's radar, he runs in front of the Lord and goes, look at Isaac. And Jesus, see, now here, here is you know, um, the person they're talking about. Here's Satan. Here's the throne of God. And Satan comes in front of God, points at one of us, says, look at Mariana. And as he's doing that, Jesus walks in front of Mariana and says, she's one of mine. That's what it means he's our advocate. He is our intercessor. What is Jesus doing right now? It says in the book of Hebrews 7, 24 and 25, he's ever living to intercede for us. What does that mean? He goes to court and he represents us before God and goes like this when Satan's accusing us. There's a hymn about that. Do you all know before the throne of God above? When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. It's a beautiful old hymn about the work that Jesus does to intercede for us. So Satan here is no longer allowed to do that. He can't come and accuse us. And verse 9 says, now this is the most important verse to tie all these together. Look what it says in verse 9. So the great dragon, right there, was cast out, that serpent of old, there's that name, called the devil, there he is, and Satan, who deceives, do you see it's all the same person? And one verse ties them all together. He is the one from the Garden of Eden that tempted Eve. He is the one who tempted Christ in the wilderness. He is the dragon that's fighting, trying to keep Christ from being born. And he is the adversary, Satan, who deceives the whole world. What, what is the one thing 
that Jesus said Satan is most involved in, deception. And that's what I hope you never forget. Satan wants to get your mind off target. To be deceived means you, you have some form of lie that you're believing. That's what deception is. And his angels were cast out with him. So that's Satan's defeat. Hebrews 2.14 reminds us that Jesus through death destroyed him that had the power of death, that is the devil. That's what it says in Hebrews 2.14. And uh, saints that overcome, notice how the saints overcome. By the way, people get saved in the tribulation and they're on earth and Satan is totally opposed to them. And what do they do? Verse 10, uh, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, salvation and strength, the kingdoms of our God and the power of Christ have come for the accuser. That's, that's remember what he's doing as a slandering accuser of our brethren who accuse them before our God day and night. That's what I just told you about. That Satan all the time was standing in front of God pointing when we fail and Jesus was interceding. That's verse 10. But look how they overcome verse 11. For, now, now notice it, there are beautiful wording for how these saints resist. And it's good lessons for us, how they resist the devil. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives unto death. This, this beautiful, they, they have faith in Christ's blood, they have a testimony of hope in Christ's death, and they love Jesus most. They love him through life and unto death. It's, it's just amazing that they overcome the devil. Now, what, what is Satan up to? What is his plan? What is he trying to do? And basically what we see starting in verse 16 is that he's trying to destroy Israel. Do you realize that God staked his name on Israel? God said, I actually, God sovereignly elected Israel. All of you from Presbyterian backgrounds, tell your dad you believe in the sovereign election of Israel. He'll go, wow. You know, if your dad's a pastor, tell him that. Sovereign election means God picked Israel. Now, you all know that. God looked all through the earth and he picked Abraham. He found Abraham and he picked him and he said, you're going to become the father of many peoples like the sand of the seashore. Abraham was one person and he was too old to have children when God told him that. And you know the story that God supernaturally allowed Sarah to have a child and it was a child of promise when Abraham was 99 years old. And what a blessing it is, okay? God picked Israel. As soon as God picked Israel, Satan had one target. God staked his name on Israel. Satan wants to destroy Israel. Every day in the news, if you read about Iran, they're the current country Satan is using the most to destroy Israel. Iran threatens the destruction of Israel daily. Did you know it says in the Bible that Persia is empowered by a demon. Persia is the name of Iran up until the 40s. And then it would, in the British mandate, it became part of this new group of nations called Iran. But what, what is Satan doing? Verse 16, and the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman. The woman is Israel. The dragon is Satan. And, and the woman clothed in the sun with the stars that has this child that is caught up to heaven. Uh, you notice what it says, uh, verse 13 of chapter 12. When the dragon saw he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. That's Christ. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time, times, and a half a time. What is that? Three and a half years. It's for half the tribulation. For half the tribulation, God protects Israel. And Satan does everything he can. That's what this flood is. He sends an army and God stops him. Okay, enough on uh, chapter 12. Now it even gets better. You know what chapter 13 is about? 
It's about how do you escape the mark of the beast? You've all heard the mark of the beast, you know, on the forehead and the hand. How do you escape the mark of the beast? Now, if you say that with anybody in their 20s, they'll go, I'm interested in that. Because everybody's heard of the mark of the beast. There have been so many books, you know, Tim LaHaye uh, wrote all those uh, Left Behind books. Before him, Hal Lindsey wrote them. There have been so many movies, people preach about this. What is the mark of the beast? What, what, what is this whole thing? Well, remember, we're talking about, in the book of Revelation, the word revelation means unveiling of whom? Who's the whole book of Revelation about? Jesus. Every chapter is some facet of Jesus. Do you know what chapter 13 is? The genuine Jesus. What does that mean? Well, there is someone coming called the anti, what? Yeah, what does anti-Christ mean? Many people think it means against Christ. But really, the anti-Christ is not against Christ. Anti means in place of. He doesn't want to get rid of Christ. He just wants to be Christ. He wants to be the replacement. He wants to be the, the Christ that's been promised for all times. And so Satan, the Antichrist, is Satan entering a human and empowering them to become what everybody's always wanted, the perfect leader. Humans have always wanted the perfect leader. They want someone to solve all their problems. Right now in America, it's government. Government. We want, we want the government to help us with health care. We want the government to, to defend us. We want the government to provide for us, to feed us, to clothe us, you know, it, to educate us. What is the big thing in America? Free education. We want the government to pay for college. We want the government to give us a good job. We want the government to give us health care. We always want people to do what God offers. God says, I will take care of you. Look at the flowers of the field. I take care of them, how much more will I take care of you? But people always want a human. So Satan has always wanted to indwell a human and make them to become Christ, the one everyone worships and follows. Now he's had many, I mentioned the Mongols. Did you know that Genghis and company, Genghis Khan, was probably one of Satan's choices because Genghis Khan conquered from the Pacific and he almost made it to the Atlantic. You realize that? He, he almost made it to Europe. He got to the edge of Europe. He made it all the way down to Israel. Did you know that? His armies just were... Uh, Hitler was another one that, that Satan for sure thought, this was my guy. Uh, Caesars, he thought they were his guys. See, Satan, Satan doesn't really understand the Bible because you can't understand the Bible unless you're a Christian. You have to have the Holy Spirit to understand it. He's read it, but he doesn't know what it means. So he knows this guy is coming, so he always has one ready. You understand that? Satan's always had his guy ready to rule the world. And now he shows up, okay? Who is the Antichrist? He's the ultimate Superman. You understand that? Daniel tells us that, that he is a man, Daniel 7, verse 8, and I was considering the horns, and there was a little horn before whom the three horns were plucked out. This is Daniel 7. And in that horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. What are we talking about? We're talking about a superhuman whose intelligence is advanced by Satan. Now, have you ever thought what would happen if we have artificial intelligence installed in a robot and Satan indwells that robot with artificial intelligence? That's what happens during the tribulation. The beast makes an image of himself that can walk and talk and be worshipped and everything else. Really, we're getting so close. Can you imagine a robot that becomes a mouthpiece for the devil? But Satan is a superman. Uh, what is he like? 
Well, let's, let's read from 1217 of Revelation to 132. The dragon was enraged, already read that, made war with the woman, that's with Israel. He went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, that's the saints. And I stood on the sand of the sea, this is 13.1, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. The sea is the nations and this beast is coming up out of the nations, having seven heads, 10 horns, on his horn 10 crowns, and on the head a blasphemous name. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth was like the mouth of a lion, and the dragon, who's the dragon? Yeah, see it's this fallen Lucifer. The dragon, let me find myself, gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Okay, finally, Satan's person to replace Christ, God allows it to happen. And Satan can't believe he's going to get to rule the world. And that's, that's what's going on. Now, what is this going to cause on earth? Look at verse 7. And it was granted him to make war with the saints. This is chapter 13, verse 7. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Verse 8, and all who dwell on earth will worship, wow, him. That's what Satan, do you remember what Satan said to Jesus in the, on the temptation in the wilderness? He said, I'll give you all the nations of the world if you'll just bow down and what? That's all Satan has always wanted. All he's wanted is worship. Because God is worshipped, he wants to be worshipped. And so he brings this antichrist, this person, out to the world and pours out all of his power through him. By the way, do you know what the antichrist and the false prophet can do? You talk about believable. You're going to see in a moment. The false prophet can say, you want to know if we're real? And he calls down fire from heaven, anywhere he wants. He just can say, fire come down. <laughs> kind of like another movie. I mean, all that's generated by Hollywood. How would you like someone that can walk on television and burn stuff up at will like a super action hero? I mean, everybody's been watching these movies. What are we on, the 21st Marvel comic book movie right now? They've made billions of dollars. The world is so ready for it. And all of a sudden, a person comes out that can call down fire from heaven. If you saw that, wouldn't you go, wow. See, that's how believable he's going to be. Everyone wants this God that they can touch, that does what they want, and has power. And that, that completely confusing times are coming. Jesus said, that it's going to get so bad, if it were possible to deceive Christians, he would even deceive Christians into bowing down. But the Lord said, it's not possible. I keep them. That's what we call the security of the believer, that we can't be deceived by the devil. Okay, what, what did Jesus tell us about Satan? Jesus tells us in John 8, 44, actually, this is Jesus witnessing, sharing the gospel. He's sharing the gospel to the religious leaders who want to know how to be saved because they didn't like him and they didn't believe him. And Jesus said in John 8, 44, you are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And when he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of liars. Wow. So Satan is a murderer, a liar, and incites other people to lie. So earlier in John 10, Jesus said, Satan only came to kill, to steal, and to destroy. See, Satan wins by destroying people. If Satan can get someone to commit suicide, he won, because he destroyed them. If Satan can make someone murder another human, he won, because he, he loves humans, he's a murderer, he wants people to kill. He is a liar, he's a father of lies, he wants to deceive them, 
He wants to destroy. So Satan wins by destroying things. That's why the gospel wins by redeeming and by renewing and by bringing life and by saving people. It's very exciting to be an instrument in God's hands to save people from destruction. When you witness, you're saving people from destruction. Now I have something, remember I told you you should preach the gospel to yourself? I have this right here in my Bible, taped right in the front, right next to my picture of Bonnie, taped in the front. I have another picture of Bonnie back here. Um, I call this the, the signature of God. When God saves us, this is what he does. I am forgiven. God has removed my debts. Christ died the substitutionary death to take the hopeless debt owed to God, and he pays it so God will never uh, you know, make me face eternal destruction. I am justified. God has changed my state. Christ has taken me as a guilty uh, convict and destroyed every record of my sin. I am regenerated. God has given me a new heart. I am reconciled. God has become my friend. I am adopted. Did you know when we had our children, they didn't pick us and we didn't pick them. We just got them. When you adopt someone, you pick them. You know, adoption's really neat. Someone goes looking for you, wants you, goes to the orphanage and adopts you. Having children, you didn't pick them, they didn't pick you. And there's a real challenge there. God adopts us. He came looking for us, he found us. This is the gospel. Forgiveness, justification, regeneration, reconciliation, adoption, redemption. God has changed my ownership. I am bought at a price. I belong to him. I'm sanctified. God is changing my behavior. Did you know that the longer you live, the more your behavior should be changed by God? That's what sanctification is all about. And so when I preach the gospel to myself, I actually sit there and rehearse the seven elements of my salvation. Now, right there in Dropbox where the notes are is that little paper. And I would encourage you, if you ever struggle with, with kind of doubting you know, God's plan and, and what he's done in your life, and many Christians even doubt their salvation, you should preach the gospel to yourself. I would encourage you to go online, get that, run it off, put it in your Bible, and preach the gospel to yourself. Now, before we go, there are only healthy Christians and sick Christians. Which are you? Okay. What does a healthy Christian look like? If you uh, go to the doctor's office, they take your vitals, they call it. They check your pulse. You know, they, they take your temperature. They check uh, the oxygenization, of, and they put that little thing on your finger. What does a, a healthy believer look like? Number one, healthy believers are prompted by love. Jesus said, he that has my commandments and keeps them. Not because they're afraid, not because God's going to punish them, but because they love the Lord. If you're healthy... Your Christian life is prompted by love. You read the Bible because you love the Lord. You memorize scriptures because you love the Lord. You witness because you love the Lord. We are prompted, in fact, in your relationship with people, you treat them the way you should. Not because you have to, but because you want to, because you love the Lord. Secondly, Titus 2.11 says, healthy believers are trained by grace. What does Titus 2.11 say? The grace of God that brings salvation teaches us to deny ungodliness. If you're healthy, grace is teaching you to say no to sin. Uh, by the way, these are basically this verse and those three verses and these three. These are what I call my very favoritest verses in the Bible. They're how I check my spiritual health. Healthy believers make daily choices. Do you remember what they are? Ephesians 4.22. You put off the old person. You be renewed, your mind. And then you put on. That's what Ephesians 4.22 uh, through 24 says. So I put off the old sinful ways I'm acting. I let God change my mind. And then I put on the new creation I am in Christ. That's a daily choice. It isn't once at a campfire 30 years ago. It's every day. Every day I say, God, I want to take off the old, you know, fleshly ways. I want to strip them off and I want you to change by repentance my mind and I want to put on. 
Oh, this one you ought to look up. Look up Psalm 101.3. I wonder if some of you even know this verse. This is David making a sacred vow. And healthy believers make a sacred vow to the Lord. Do you know what it is? I will set, verse 3, nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those that fall away. It shall not cling to me. It's a sacred vow that I don't want anything that dishonors and displeases the Lord to entertain me. That changes every movie, every game, every music for the rest of your life. Have you ever made that sacred vow? I will set nothing wicked before me. It will not cling to me. It's not going to be part of my playlist uh, of life. Here's another one, Hebrews 9.14. Clear out the bad files. What do you do with anything bad you've seen or heard or done? Hebrews 9.14. Oh, I'll never forget the day I memorized that verse. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your mind from dead works? Did you know God can erase the files in your mind? Some of you have pictures in your mind that you should have erased. Some of you have events. Some of you have songs. Some of you, I know Bonnie's testimony that when she got saved at age 21, she said she had all these songs of, of, that were godless, and the Lord erased them. He clears out the bad files. That's what he wants to do. And then Jesus wants us, Hebrews 10, says, let us draw near in full assurance of faith, having a heart sprinkled from an evil conscience. He wants us to be bold. Do you know what the Bible says? Righteous people are as bold as a lion, but the wicked run when no one's chasing them. God wants us to have holy boldness and to renew our consecration every day to God. What does consecration mean? I surrender to you. I want you to make me as, as faithful a servant. Remember Jesus said, well done, good and faithful servant. It's me surrendering to be that servant. That's what consecration is. And it is involved in Romans 6 with me presenting. You know, if I, if I present my phone to you, I give up my control of it to you. A have you ever, you know, when you have someone take a picture of you, you go, will you take a picture of me? And you look them over to make sure they're not gonna steal your phone because you're surrendering it. God says, I want you to surrender over and over to me. Have a great break. See you in 10 minutes.